to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ebro, Laura, Rosenberg, good morning. We have Chris Alexander on the program. Give it up one time from the Office of Cannabis Management, right? That's correct. And what else do you do at the state level of New York? Just that. I'm the executive director of the Office of Cannabis Management, uh, running this this agency that's bringing this law to life. Um, And how long have you been working for this agency? Well, the agency just got started. I got appointed September 1st, 2021. Okay. Uh, as you remember, we legalized in March, um, but took some time. You know, we had some some shifting on the executive level, and then I didn't get appointed until September 1st. One of the first things that Governor Hochul did when she took office was appoint me to this role. Um, so I was uh, made aware of the processes and everything going on by Andrea Stewart Co- Cousins. Is she still the majority? She is absolutely the, still the majority leader and of the New York State Senate. And uh, it was the Senate that actually confirmed me to the position, and I used to work in the Senate for the leader uh, as counsel, helping to negotiate this bill uh, in, in you know a couple of years back. So, so, so I, the the obvious question to me: Why you? Why do you get to be the weed guy? I know a lot of guys <laughs> who got a lot of experience; they can tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. How did you get to be? It's, it's the crazy. Weed guy. It's really crazy because <laughs> the weed guy. The weed guy. No, I mean I've been working on this for for a while, for the better part of the last decade. Um, first as an advocate, um, uh, you know, kind of building a campaign around the bill, um, writing the bill, um, and then going into government to negotiate the bill. And so, you know, really, you know, what I was able to do in these last several years was kind of build a coalition around a core set of principles, get people to agree on things that they never would have agreed to before, um, and then just kind of hold the steering wheel tight to make sure that we got to the end. And now the person implementing the bill is the same person who laid out those principles. Makes right. sense. Um, so where we are today as New York State, you have now this new Office of Cannabis Management, yes, sir. which you lead. I was invited to be a part of the, uh, what do they call CAB, which yep, is the, the Cannabis Advisory Board. Advisory Board. So y'all just let anybody on, I see. Basically. Okay. <laughs> which I was invited by Andrea Stewart Cousins. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Because when we had her on the program, I was talking to her off the program, mm. I, lo- I think maybe a little bit during, during the show, uh, about... The health and wellness aspect of cannabis and about protecting the, the the mom and pop stores and these things that some other states, when they enacted, uh, you know, um, you know, recreational use of marijuana, weren't able to do either because they didn't have the foresight or they didn't, you know, whatever, whatever. And something that was really important to me wasn't just like, y'all want to be able to smoke weed. Mm-hmm. It was how do we help? You know, big mama and auntie and people that are taking all these prescription drugs that are ruining their kidneys and their liver Mm -hmm. for arthritis, sleep, you know, pain, whatever they're going through. How do we help them learn that you ain't got to smoke the weed? You can drink a tea or you can get a massage or you can oils or these other methods to help maybe prolong some of the internal organs uh, that people are having failure from. Yeah, no, we definitely have a, a lot of education to do in the community. That's part of also the reason why, you know, why, why I was given the opportunity to run this office. Just the time that we've spent running around the state trying to break through stigma uh, and change people's hearts and minds and the language that they have, uh, you know, attributed to cannabis and cannabis use. Um, but, you know, really, you've been talking about that for a while. Um, and we're really honored to be at a, in a position where we can make sure that we're educating the community on the benefits of cannabis, as well as some of the potential risks of cannabis use, particularly for young people. Um, and so, you know, what you also spoke to right there in terms of keeping mom and pops uh, in business here, you know, we, in t- we often in government have the, uh, the, the tendency to set it and forget it. Right, like to do something and to let it go and think, okay, we did the thing, let's move on. Uh, what we were doing as, as drafting the bill and you know, we kept fine tuning, we kept looking at what was working and not working in other states and kept fine tuning the process to make sure that when we were able to finally get it done here in New York, we were able to protect those, those small businesses. And, and really I, I wanna talk them. about the different licenses yeah. and how you can't have certain things to protect the little guy. We'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. I think first it's important too, since I'm talking about being on this board, because I'm on this board, I can't be in cannabis business. Mm. Gotcha. Like I can't own a dispensary. I can't grow and sell. I can't invest in Joe. Like I can't be on the money making side of cannabis while I'm on this board. And I don't think anybody else can. Can Well, they? so actually on the control board, which is uh, headed up by, um, uh, Chairwoman Tremaine Wright, they're the ones fully, uh, you know, cut out from the industry. The advisory board, you can have interest, but you can't, 
you know, advocate for your own interests while being right. on the Got advisory it. Oh, okay, board. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of a more, you know, we put that in to make sure that we weren't creating these rules in a vacuum. Like, we weren't just doing this and not getting feedback from the community. We weren't getting uh, feedback from public health professionals who have some ideas about how cannabis can be rolled out uh, in, a, in a positive way. And so the advisory board is, is much more that, making sure that we have constant input, and then they have the added uh, purpose that we talked about a lot of making sure that the revenue that we generate gets to the places that it needs to go. And, and that's, so that's specifically the board that I'm on, which is one once the tax yeah. revenue is collected, who are the grassroots organizations and specifically for me, the zip codes in our state that were most affected by drug laws, because you can right. break it down by zip code and look at where people lived and who was affected and who went to jail and mm -hmm. their economic situation and how can we take those tax dollars and get it back into those communities, right, so that we could build programs, learning Grants, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. it's really a crazy thing. I mean, so other states have tried to carve out a piece of the revenue to like reinvest in communities, uh, but none have been able to do what we've been able to do here in New York in, in terms of protecting such a significant piece. And we didn't, you know, we have 40% going to the community grants reinvestment fund, which I'll talk about, but we carved up all of the revenue. Right. There's there's a hundred percent of that revenue is going back to communities, 40 percent going directly to public education, which will serve everybody. Twenty percent going to drug treatment and prevention and education. And then that last 40 is what we're most excited about uh, going to things like job training, reentry services, after school programs, um, financial literacy programs, just all these things that we know our communities have needed for so long, but there's no money for it. And now we've got a, a constant stream of, of revenue going to these programs to help uplift. So where is New York right now? Yeah, so we, we've been at it now for, for just about a year. Um, uh, at the end of, of 2022, I was you know, really honored to be able to make the first sale as we opened the first adult use dispensary, legal dispensary. So we'll talk about that, right I'm sure. Right over here on Astor Place. Yep, yep, okay. yep. So it's run by Housing Works, a nonprofit that serves formerly incarcerated and those living with HIV and AIDS. And so we had a... I didn't know it's Housing Works. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so Housing Works opened that first dispensary. Um, we have issued almost 300 licenses in that first year. We revamped the medical program that's been in existence here for seven years. Uh, we made our cannabinoid hemp program, the sale of CBD. We, we formalized that program, which is kind of largely a pilot for a while. At the same time of getting the program running, writing the rules and regs, we were also able to build up the agency. So now I've got a, 150 folks working to bring this thing to life, you know, economists, public health professionals, uh, folks uh, doing licensing and, and community engagement. So it's really a beautiful thing. So right now, Agency is getting built up. We still got about a halfway to, you know, another 150 folks to go. Uh, but also we have issued licenses. We have a, a supply chain that's established. Um, and we're just now focused on rolling out these dispensaries. We got to get them going. So a lot of people, and, and I've watched this in California. I watched this in Washington, Colorado, Oregon, just because I know people that live there. Mm -hmm. Everyone that either used to sell weed, you know, out of their house illegally, whatever, or at some point wanted to get into the weed business, thinks that they can run a dispensary, which is a brick and mortar storefront. You got to follow codes. You got to follow certain guidelines to manage the cash, right? Because at the federal level, you can't take the money and just put it in any old bank. Can you? You, you have access to banking now. You just don't have access to the full suite of banking services, right? So like loans, for example, you're not really getting loans, except you know there's certain small situations. State chartered banks are giving some loans. We're on trying to encourage that. On the state level, that. but not on the not federal. on the federal level, right. exactly. But you can get bank accounts uh, more easily now. You can have debit card services at these dispensaries. It is still mostly cash, uh, but you know really the the challenge is for businesses operating without full access to credit and loans is is difficult. And so a lot of people don't know that part. Yeah. And then the other part is actually managing the code uh, and the on-site cannabis, like the shelf life of the product mm -hmm. and these other things. And will there be an agency going throughout the state checking, I'm pretty sure, when this thing... Oh, we're the regulatory body. We do lab testing. Uh, we do compliance. We make sure that all the growers and the retailers are maintaining compliance. We, we write the rules for them, and then we go out and we enforce it. So, you know, right now... Uh, you know, obviously, I'm I'm alluding to the illicit shops who are not obviously in compliance and operating without a license with products that haven't been tested. Yo, yo, yo! Don't snitch on these guys. There's a lot, a lot well, of good stuff is, going yeah. on out there. Well, so I mean, remember, it's a problem. I got a, you know, I got a bone to pick with them. Okay, so, go so, ahead. Yeah. Well, no. So remember a few weeks ago when I got on the air and I said, "Hey, y'all, if you out here and you've been selling in this gray space, be careful because they're coming knocking on your door. They and they're going to confiscate." 
Everything. Your marijuana. They may not take you to jail, but they're going to confiscate your yeah, product. So they the got person like a, who made sure you didn't go to jail and just your product was confiscated was this person. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you made sure it was just a confiscation. Well, and I mean, you guys did get a lot, though, a couple weeks ago, I saw, right? We, every day. Every day we're, see, we're seizing millions of dollars worth of product. Um, but, but no, you're right. I mean, we started with uh, an education-first approach, right? When we legalize, you know, there's a celebratory moment, you know, everybody's happy and people smoke in the streets and it's a beautiful thing. You know, the, the Nas I imagined walking the streets without smoking the streets without cops harassing. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, but we didn't just end prohibition and say, let's go crazy. We ended the prohibition, create a system to, to tax and regulate right. because we want that money to come back to communities because we wanted to give opportunities to black and brown entrepreneurs who didn't have those opportunities before. So we have these broader principles and the folks to me operating outside of that space are violating that. Now, we are the same folks who work to end prohibition. It's the same groups of advocates that you know that you've talked with before uh, who said we need to stop, you know, way back in Bloomberg administration, we got to stop stop and frisk. We got to stop, you know, making people empty their pockets and throwing them up against the wall and, and really, you know, for um, getting them locked up for, for small amounts of weed. It's the same people that then also transition to this legal framework. So you gotta understand there's a, there's a principle driving the, the frustration behind the illicit shops. So we're not uh, reincarcerating folks. The goal is not prohibition part two, but we're definitely gonna protect what we built. We have an opportunity right now in New you York. You ain't gonna mess this up, basically. You're not gonna mess this up. By just selling weed in every single smoke shop. Cause I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna keep it real with you. Yeah. I, I can't walk in a smoke shop without seeing weed for sale and more than weed. I'll be yeah. honest with you. It's out here. Yeah. We, we, and we, so we, we, you know, we've That's seen. That's dry snitching, by the way. What, <laughs> right yeah. what do you expect? Just look, so we're but, clear. You're no, right. we're aware. We're aware of all the illicit operators. We started with education. We started with cease and desist. We're going to send a cease and desist to you, to your business partners, to the landlord, to everybody that knows that this is going on. Cease and, please stop. Because not only are you frustrating our goals, but you're going to put yourself in, in danger for criminal and financial penalties. It sounds pretty and nice, please, though. And please right. don't be out here breaking the law while you've already broken the law. Yo, it, <laughs> like, please don't be the person that's out here doing this and you got warrants and a bunch of other stuff going on. Because Yo, you then know, you're going to jail. Like, they're going to come confiscate. Right. Yeah. And, now and gonna, then they're going to be like, oh, we've been looking for you. No. <laughs> and, and not only that, actually, it's almost the opposite. It's like almost we were looking not to find you. We were hoping we to were hoping. not do this. And you're literally forcing our hand. It's kind of crazy when you think about all the people yeah. who got arrested, did actual time over BS yeah. weed charges. And now you got people doing dumb stuff when they're about to be able to do it legally. And you guys are being like, hey. Could you please stop? Like, we'd really prefer if you didn't do that. And they're like, no, must sell now. Like, yeah. it seems very short-sighted, I guess. I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating as hell. And so we we started with the education, and then we started confiscating. We just so run in these shots. Did you confiscation? I did not. I did not. In, in all fairness, <laughs> in all fairness, there are people out yeah. here trying to do it the legal way. Sure. They've applied for a license. Sure. They haven't heard back. Yeah. Why would why if I've applied for a license, may I not have heard from the Office of Cannabis Management on whether or not I've been approved for my license? Yeah, so we've only issued now three license types, right? We've got our conditional cultivator license, conditional processor license, and now we've started to issue our retail license. We've only been able to issue 36 of the retail licenses. We are doing just over 150 on the retail side. We have the 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 cap will be 150. It's not it's it's just for this retail license round. There's no okay. license caps in New York. We realize that with the, you know in other states when they put these license caps on it's really just a way to keep you know folks out right and so we don't have a cap we're going to grow the market to meet the demand and see where we end up um but for the the conditional cultivator and, and process aside it was folks who were previously engaged small farmers we tried to prioritize small farmers they're one of the groups in our law that we're supposed to make sure we create opportunities for so it's not just big business those small farmers get an opportunity for the card which is what we call it the retail opportunity you know we did something special we did something that's never been done before. Everybody's talking about how, you know, folks who've been impacted need an opportunity. We made it a requirement for eligibility that you have a previous conviction, right? Which was something that obviously, you know, people felt different ways about, but it's <laughs> it not. It sounds crazy. <laughs> but it's like, like we said, we, you know, the same folks who wrote the bill, who led the advocacy are the same folks running the shop. So those, those principles are coming through now. Right? And, and, and really quick. Um, so there's multiple licenses. So somebody yeah. watching this is hearing you say you had to have a previous conviction to get a retail license. But there's different types of retail licenses. Yeah, we just and, didn't open those yet. Right. But they're not open yet. Yeah, but coming. just so people understand, there's different ways to get into the business. There's wholesale. 
mm-hmm. right? There's growing, there's wholesale. It, distribution, we call it. Yeah. Distribution. There's uh, the, what did you call it? Like processing. Processing, so, which is the extraction and just making yeah. products. Mm-hmm. Then there's retail. Mm-hmm. Then there's micro retail. Micro business. Micro business. Which is unique. And I want to I talk about this too because, you know, what also, and there's a lot of lessons learned that I'm just trying to squeeze into the time. But, uh, you know, for the micro license, we created a system in New York where we saw that what we call vertical integration, which is basically that you have to grow, process, and sell, was too capital intensive for our people to get in. Well, right. and also could become uh, monopolistic. It's a, exactly where where a big corporation could be like we're growing because it's expensive. wholesaling, we doing this, and then the little guy can never Can't do anything. And this is still New York City. This is still New York City real estate. So you you're competing on every front to to you know to be successful. So what we did in New York is we prohibited vertical integration, except for that micro license, right? And that micro license is basically a way for a small business to scale, for you to develop a brand, grow your own product. Get your own strains together, develop a product or a brand or strain, whatever, and then you're able to go out and sell that at retail. Once you grow to a certain point, then you transition to a part, a, you know, a single operation, whether you want to focus on cultivation or processing or just on the retail side. So and do you believe that micro, that license, micro license, really license is the best, will be when it's time? Hand- will that be the best entry point? for the around the way business the small business it depends you know most of the legacy we call them legacy folks who was doing this before most of those you know folks really they don't then some of them are not cultivators right they don't grow large scale wheat and they're not they, they're gonna have some challenges maintaining compliance growing at a large it's different growing in your backyard and growing in a hundred thousand square feet so really a lot of them do distribution and a lot of them do kind of packaging and branding, right? So the micro is actually a really, you know, attractive opportunity for them who are trying to get their foot in, develop a brand, but also, I mean, it still could be a three to five million dollar business, just just that small business. Um, but I think it'll be really attractive. But for folks who are, you know, for our card, for example, uh, when we, you say card, you mean license? The, the current retail license that we just that we have open, the only yeah. retail. We had folks who were previously convicted of a marijuana offense, but they also had business experience. And so a lot of them who are going to be most of folks who ran restaurants, who ran convenience stores, who ran like, you know, sneaker shops, those are because they're moving goods. They know how to do retail is the place to be. If you don't know how to grow wheat to scale, you know, it, it's a challenge. And we're, we're doing stuff to support people, but that is definitely going to be a challenge and something you're going to have to grow into. So I think micro is very sexy, but it depends on what you were doing before. And how many different entry points now at for, for New York State? Because I feel like there's more entry points in New York State than any other Absolutely. state. And Absolutely. how many are there? When you're talking about growing... Wholesale, et cetera. How many different? Yeah, we we've, we've got nine license types. We've added two with these condition three with these conditional licenses, but there's nine license types. So it's cultivation, processing. We have a co-op license. Uh, we have uh, distribution. We have retail delivery, on-site consumption, which is going to be interesting as we roll that out. Um, and so you know, and the micro. And so we you know we have some exciting opportunities that folks can come in, focus on that thing, right? And again, the restriction on vertical integration is not what big business wants to hear. But it's all about creating multiple access points so folks can come in, have space to operate. Those mom and pops have space now on the retail tier where they can't be co-opted and, and, and basically bought bought out by, you know, folks who uh, don't share their interests or, or similarly situated as them. So uh, I just want and we're going to have more conversations on this because I feel like um, it's an it's it's a once in a longer than a generation opportunity. Right. Imagine if you had the ability to get into liquor. Of when course. prohibition and yeah. you were able to gift that business to whomever, right? Um, you can, like he said, you could have a couple of million dollar business just in a neighborhood mm. where you're taking care of older folks, family members, growing for people, teaching them what the benefits, helping them with pain management. Because I think I've always thought this. I don't really believe, I think there's a smoker who loves going to a dispensary mm. and is like, ooh, this is cool. It's like a playground of weed. Like, I get all the, it's beautiful. I get all these different choices. And I think there's a, another type of person, which is a majority of people, that really just wants to call somebody they know, get some good advice on what they're looking for, and it's right around the corner from them. So that's a that's an interesting distinction for the folks. Some folks are appreciating the uh, the illicit shops right now, right? But what they, what I try to communicate to folks is like, this is not the same experience as having your dealer, right? Your dealer cares about you as a, as a customer. They want to keep that relationship. They want to keep bringing you hot fire. They want to, they want to keep doing that, right? 
the, the these shops they don't care. it's it's all about volume right it's just in yeah. and out volume right so that that care about the quality of product mm -hmm. that care about what's in the product yeah. they don't have that the product labeling you know knowing what you're getting and where it's from and where, where it's stores from that that's not that's not a relationship that exists right now and so when people try to kind of conflate the dealers and these shops this is not it's not the same thing and the shops are not taking street weed Right. They're not taking the week. So there's also, you know, some other conversation that happened there that's happening in our communities right now. And there's, and there's violence happening because of that. Um, the the other piece of it is the delivery piece, which I think, you know, which was I was talking to Andrew yeah. Stewart Cousins about and a lot of people. And I'm glad we got it done, which is the the little guy who is the Uber driver. Mm. He's the Uber Eats guy. And now when the licenses come available now, is that something that I'll be able to do as a as somebody who uses my car? as a business to be able to do my Uber driving, do my Uber Eats delivering and do my weed delivering as well. So we, we actually, we try to take a uh, interesting approach to that one to not allow for the takeover of, you know, big tech in, in on the delivery side, particularly. So we wanted to make the delivery license as well, uh, a small business approach as well. So there's a cap on how many employees a delivery uh, business can have is 25 employees. And really it's to focus that so that delivery driver doesn't have to go through a third party platform, you know, and like the Ubers or whatever to become or weed maps. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we mess a little different, but yeah, yeah, exactly. So they can themselves kind of, in, you know, employ oh, because Weed other Maps folks. actually helps the delivery person. Because Weed Maps gets you to see all the stores, and then the stores work with a delivery person to get exactly. To the yeah, door. it's a little different. They they're more so elevating the brands on the really the production and processing side much more than the delivery side. So it's a little different. Yeah. Um, what happens next with the licenses? When's the next round of licenses going out? So we're still licensing card. I, I didn't speak about this, but we do have a, a injunction in place uh, for a couple of our, you know, we broke up the state into regions. So folks applied with their conviction and their previous business experience. We broke up the state into 14 regions and uh, an individual who, um, who didn't meet the qualifications has uh, sued the state. Uh, uh, because of that. And so we have five regions of the state that are enjoined where we can't issue licenses in those states. That's part of kind of the holdup in the process. Uh, but we're still rolling out licenses in the other nine regions. And so, you know, we, we'll, we have a board meeting coming up. Uh, announce, announcement should come soon. But we have a board meeting coming up where we'll roll out some additional licenses. Um, and then after that, I mean, what I, you know, really want to uh, talk about as well is, you know, we're, we just rolled out the regulations for the, pro, for the broader program. Um, that is the rules of, you know, uh, not delivery licenses incorporating that, but the other license types, you know, cultivation and micro and retail. And so the rules are out now for public comment. Now, we're a different kind of agency in that, you know, we are much more public facing and engaged with the public on in this process. And so uh, we are really encouraging folks to go on to our website, uh, cannabis.ny.gov, go on the regulations tab, you know, check out the regs, submit comments so we can fine tune this thing. Right? Cannabis.ny.gov. Yep. Yep. And you go, you tap on regulations. Yep. And public comment is open until when? Uh, for the adult use package, it's open until February 13th, right? And so we're also running around the state doing, you know, talk. We've, we've been doing this for the last year uh, to get folks educated on what we're doing. Um, so we're going to continue doing that. We got a, a, a drop off in the Heights on the 19th, uh, which I think is Thursday, tomorrow. Um, um, and so we'll be there talking about this program, the rules that we that we've drafted, um, and asking folks to submit comments. And you called it a drop off. I mean, you're just we're we're gonna be there. I don't okay, know. Okay. I was like, yo, y'all dropping off weed? Like people need to show up and get some smoke. Um, and is there a listing of where these drop offs or these community these sessions, moments, yeah, sessions? Yeah, sessions. Well, I like sessions. Yeah, sessions. either way, it sounds like something. Are going we blazing down. at these things? Are we smoking? We are not smoking at these things. Oh, got it. Uh, we got one on the nineteenth. We have. Um, I'll send the full list, but we have one in the LES as well. Come in LES coming up on uh, the following week, and then we got a couple more stops to make. Do we have an Instagram account? We do, we do. It's NYS underscore cannabis. Un NYS underscore cannabis. That's also our Twitter account where you can see everything that we're doing. Um, you know, we have uh, a broad mandate here and, and also a broad opportunity. You mentioned the lottery thing. Uh, you know, the black community, particularly here in New York, you know, we had the numbers and then we didn't. And we didn't benefit in that transition. Um, now we have a situation where, uh, you know, the first real situation where there's actually a true commitment, not in leadership, but in the in the letter of the law, uh, a commitment to make sure that people are a part of this business, 
people benefit from the business, but they're also engaged fully in the rest of the process. And I don't want us to miss that opportunity. We, we This cannot be an that opportunity. That opportunity you speak of is money. That opportunity is money. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and There's money a lot of coming money. to communities. And I know we're getting in the weeds, uh, but... Um, <laughs> but... Uh, these two are a perfect example yeah. of regular everyday people yeah. who want to know where what's going on, but as soon as you go to tell them, they tune out. Yeah, and, and they're, 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 and look at their Twitter faces. Account. They're like, "So what's yeah. up with the weed?" And you're like, "Well, this." They're like, "It's a lot." And then it's like, "Yo, the weed money didn't go to the proper places." See, this is what's wrong with the government. <laughs> yeah. They don't handle it right. Well, you wasn't paying attention, bro. We <laughs> needed you to show up. We needed you to comment. We need. There's processes and things you got to do when you're running a business. The government's a business. They got to follow policy. They got to do things. And they need people to pay attention if you give a shit. The, the number one thing I get asked, we've organized now. We've been organizing around this issue for a long time. Uh, and I'm young, but I've been working on this for a long time. And the number one question I get asked now, are y'all doing it for real? Right? Like, is this for real? Folks who... They don't have faith. They don't have... You know, but people don't have faith in government generally... But this is the example that we have to change it to show that like this this could work if we all pitch in, lean in, and take it seriously. So boom, first and just so we're clear, retail and all these licenses have to go out. Mm -hmm. Then they have to be taxed, at which point the money is then collected, which would take us not this year but to next. We've yeah, I mean we've already started taxing because we get we get we get taxed on the point of transaction, so from the cultivator to processor, so that all is captured as well, and the of course the tax at the point of sale. So we've already started collecting, but yes, you're right. Is thinking about when the money's gonna start rolling out. So there will just be a point. Next year. Let's call it next year. Yep. Where there will be a bunch of money. Me and others on the cannabis advisory board will be sitting there, and there'll be a budget. And we'll be divvying up that money mm -hmm. to go to places. Yep. How do people get their community organizations prepared to receive these grants, this money, and for it to come actually back? Because that's going to be a thing. You don't just get to say, yo, I need some money, yo. What's good? Right. You got to have your shit like, in order to be to an apply, organization. Apply that apply for these grants? Yeah, you're going to have to do so, all that. It's just, that's actually a process that you get to decide <laughs> how it's going to work. Now, so we have other kind of model grant-making processes in government where, you know, you come through with a proposal. You say, this is what I want to do. This is the impact that it's going to have. Here's who it's going to serve. Here's the community that's going to, you know, and you, there's just basically an evaluation, you know, of each individual proposal. But you all can decide to have a different approach to it. And I think, you know, what we need to do definitely is make sure that it's fully transparent, that people get to, you know, really show not just the the potential impact, but the need, right? right. So, and we know the need is there, especially for some of these, you know, other types of programs. Should we make a TV show like Shark Tank? Well, it's, where it, the cannabis advisory board sitting there and people got to come <laughs> in and pitch? We yeah. could do that. We could do that. I mean, it's, it's an open body. So yeah. everything that y'all do is going to be public. Right. Everything's going to be open. So that's another thing. People think, oh, this is behind closed doors. Like, nah, it's an open meeting. You had two meetings already, uh, both open meetings. We've got another one uh, coming up next week. So it'll be an open, everybody's recording there just tune in you know this is chris alexander of the office of cannabis management you guys think we covered it all for you for you guys that already smoke weed but aren't really paying attention and been smoking weed illegally hmm. criminals yeah, over here I, criminals i, I, I tell can you. help with some timeline stuff I no. Classes yeah, I, yeah. I, I can help with some timeline I, stuff if that's if that's helpful. No, I mean I feel like that was more information than I ever possibly could have consumed <laughs> on the subject. <laughs> right. I, so uh, no, I thought it was very interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's gonna be whole, the whole thing's gonna be. I really hope a cool opportunity for a lot of people. Right. I, I have my doubts because I have my doubts about everything related to the government. But well, let's. You seem like a great guy, though, so I feel good about it. I appreciate the, that. By the way, well, the ratio of your jacket to cuff is. <laughs> <laughs> never well, and then you, there's thank you. this guy. <laughs> and then there's the. We give the grant to what is a seemingly thorough organization in whomever's community. Mm -hmm. And then if they mismanage it or at that level. Oh, of course. And that's possible, too. And that's, is it possible? Yeah. I mean, that's all that happens in this country. That's people what really happens most of the audit. time. Right. We the money audit. gets distributed. People then drop the ball when they have the money. Right. Especially if they're high. Just kidding. Um and this is not, and this is not going to be small change. I mean, and I, I know you know the projections have been out there for a while, but like, give us you know, a number. New York will be the biggest market in the world, I believe. And so, you know, if we're getting and we're getting to a billion dollars in revenue, that's forty percent. That's that's four hundred million dollars a year, right? And so that's not 
four hundred not... million dollars going to communities, divvied up to, you know, zip codes that were high stop and frisk, high, you know, incarceration around drugs. Yeah. You no, know, it's... all of it. Listen, it sounds incredible. It's game changing. I just want to see it. Yeah. In your opinion, um, what is the state that's handled it the best? It's it's different pieces. Not everybody's done, you know, market architecture, I would say Washington State is mm -hmm. kind of the closest model to us in terms of they have same restrictions across the tiers, what we call them. That's like cultivation to retail that, that break up so that there's opportunity and not monopolization. And so when the mom and pop, let's say, loses their retail location, loses their license, a big corporation that's growing and... Doing, can't swoop down and start taking all these little licenses from people yeah and, right. and cornering the market yeah right. and, and in terms of you know equity proposal I mean it's, it's us I mean we're, we're we learn from everybody that's tried to do something right not just put in capital behind it but real support services so people are successful we cannot just hand people a license and expect that they're going to make it even though that paper may be worth 10 million dollars they may leave there and not know what to do with it. They may, you know, cannibalize their company trying to get equity to get started. You know, the card program is unique, the retail, initial retail program, because we decided to take on the barriers to entry head on. We're not just giving them that initial retail licenses so they get first mover advantage. We're giving them real estate. We're going out and leasing dispensaries and building it out for them, right? Oh. So that we guarantee their success. And, you know, in other states where they tried to do some revenue redistribution, you have to start with the big players. So now you start with the big players so that they can generate revenue because those are the only people you can bet on. And then there's no market space for everybody else right, because right. they got it. What we're doing differently is, no, no, no. We have folks who have business experience and they're also from our law just dictates that they got to go first and they have business experience. Let's give it to them. Let's see if they can make it and let's give them some tools to be successful. Then we'll generate from that revenue the additional supports needed for other folks who have the concepts, the ideas, and the excitement, but might not have the business acumen so that they're in a better business to succeed as well. So it's, it's just it's just a level of like, you know, I, this is the, the the quote that says equity is not a thing, it's the thing. In many places, it's kind of like a program. It's like a thing that you, you roll out and see what happens. Uh, for us... Everything that we do, every conversation that we have, every rule that we create is about how do we ensure actual diversity and participation and not shoot ourselves in the foot uh, while we're doing it. So how do we create the opportunity without messing up future uh, space for people to operate and be successful? This guy's good. He's very yeah. good. He's good. Uh, his name's Chris Alexander. Look him up. Office of Cannabis Management. Thank you for your time today. And as I have info that I think is uh, interesting and applicable, I'll continue to share. And, you know, thanks for, you. thanks for making me a part of the board, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. The Thank weed you. man. Roll that shit <laughs> like that shit smoke. <laughs>